Peter said to Paul, you know all those words we own are just the rules of the game and the rules are the first to go. Now talking to God is low, begging Hardy for a gun. I got a girl in the world, and I wonder what it is we've done. Paul said to Pete, you gotta rock yourself a little harder. Pretend the dove from above is a dragon and your feet are on fire. Got a girl in the warm party, the only thing I know to do is turn up the music and play that she makes it through. fly around in there but we can't see them I got a girl in the wall Paul I know that they can hear me yell if they can't find a way to help or they can go to hell if they can't find a way Said to peach, you gotta rock yourself a little harder. Send the dove from above is a dragon and your feet are on fire. I got a girl in the war and polar eyes are like champagne. The spark on bubble moving in the morning, all you got is rain. Spark on bubble over in the morning, all you got is rain. Spark on bubble over in the morning, all you got is rain. Just the rules of the game and the rules are the first to go. Now talking to God is low, begging Hardy for a gun. I got a girl in the world, man, I wonder what it is we've done. Hey, y'all. Hope everybody's enjoying the weekend. Uh, uh, hopefully you got some coffee back there and picked up a sheet for the service. Uh, we have beer. So we, it's left over from last night's Pints and Parables event. Uh, we love to recoup our costs with a recommended donation of $2 per beer. So if you would like some delicious persimmon hollow beer, uh, you may get some here. Um, you can sign up for the weekly or support collective financially back there at the support and connect table. If you are online, 
Uh, you can use your Google login to chat with us. Ian McNabb is on right now, and there's other folks watching. Uh, use your Google login. We can tell that you're watching, but we can't talk with you if you don't log in. Uh, we've had a lot of traffic these last few days with Pete's events and a lot of new subscribers to the YouTube channel. So if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, and can, um, the Pete Rollins uh, train keeps on rolling. After tonight's service, he'll be at Stetson tomorrow at 2 p.m. under the library in room 25L, uh, giving a talk called Radical Subtraction. There will be books for sale, and he will sign them. There will also, uh, the collective store was also going to be open afterward with t-shirts, stickers, and mugs. Ben? Um, so, a uh, couple updates. I mentioned, uh, I don't know how long ago it was, four or five weeks ago, that we found out recently they have to replace the roof on this building, which is uh, not as cheap as you would think. A um, little bit of tar, a couple shingles. Um, very expensive. Uh, so we are, we are trying to uh, raise some money in our first ever capital fund, building fund, to uh, help defray the cost, although our sponsoring congregation, First United Methodist, has agreed and are able to uh, cover a big portion of that, but we don't want to just take the handout. We want to sort of pull our own weight as well. So our goal initially was to try and raise around $5,000 by this coming Tuesday. We are currently rated around $3,000, which is pretty awesome. Um, also, we said, considering that we just got done pledging a budget, that we're living within our means, we're doing really well financially. So the fact that a group of people could also dig deep and go above and beyond that is amazing. So thank you so much for the people that have given to that. Um, and if you want to and you're able, um, you can give at collectivegives.com and just make sure you select building fund from the drop down menu. Um, and that's collectivegives.com. Uh, so Kenny mentioned the online store is going to be open. Um, we are actually going to be physically able to like take credit cards, take cash and stuff after the service tonight. And we decided for the next 48 hours in order to help sort of hit our, our deadline, anything you want to buy collective gear wise, t-shirts, mugs, stickers, any of that stuff, we'll put all of that towards the building fund just to get us that much closer. So uh, if you've been holding out to get your collective swag, now's the time to get it. Um, <laughs> So uh, you may have heard of this. This is uh, a new thing that we're doing. I'm really thrilled, actually, to put him on the spot. Clark Orr is with us in the room tonight. Um, yeah, some of you are like, who's Clark Orr? <laughs> so uh, for those of you that are clapping and don't know why, um, Clark has been uh, my best friend for coming up on 15 years and is a phenomenally talented graphic designer. Um, we are lucky enough to sort of have him as a part of this congregation. He did the branding for Collective. He's also done a bunch of branding for Pete Rollins. Uh, so he uh, provided this amazing artwork for this idea we had called Sunday Soul Brunch. Um, so we're going to start on the heels of really successful Easter services for the last four years, which we've done at 11 a.m. at Cafe Da Vinci. We're going to start doing once a month um, a very music-driven, uh, sort of thoughtful brunch service at 11 a.m. every month, second Sunday of every month at Cafe Da Vinci. So this first one will be next weekend. The Lee Boys are a phenomenal uh, sacred steel sort of electric gospel band that's going to be really good. Um, so here's the thing, though. Uh, and oh, I, I have to say this too. Where's Robert? There he is. So this is Robert. Everybody say, hey, Robert. Hey, Robert. Um, Robert is in another band. You can clap for him if you want to. That was. <laughs> I haven't even told you why he's so great. Um, <laughs> Robert is in another band called Jessica Flood and the Sleepless Breeders, and they are actually going to be our local opening act for the first ever Sunday Soul Brunch. So that's going to be amazing. So if you don't know anything else about it, you should just come to support Robert. The catch is this. Uh, we made the first event free, right? And so when you tell people you can come to this, it's brunch, it's amazing music, it's free. Um, Apparently, they respond to that. And so the ticket count as of today, and, and we said, though, you are required to go online and actually get a free ticket um, because it's limited seating. So there are 316 people who have responded that they're interested in coming to this. Um, <laughs> At which point we said, okay, we've reached the threshold of free. Um, so now the key is this. The tickets now, if you go online, if you go to sundaysoulbrunch.com, the tickets cost $10 now, but they've also put in a special collective discount code. So you can still get your ticket for free. I love this, though. We can't get around the service fee, so you will have to pay 31 cents. Um, <laughs> this is on you for waiting. So if you didn't get your tickets yet, 
you are going to be annoyed by having to pay 31 cents to come. Um, but uh, hopefully this will, will help people to understand. And in, in this, we want to be very, very clear about two things. Number one, this will be uh, a, a costing event in the future. So it'll probably be between $12 and $15 to cover the cost of the band and the brunch. But we wanted to get everybody out for this first one and let them kind of see and feel what it's about. Um, the following month, though, happens to fall on Mother's Day. So mothers will be free um, for the second Sunday Soul Brunch, which be sort of a beautiful thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is this. We will still always have the 5 p.m. service here, even though we have Sunday Soul Brunch over there. And part of the thinking is we don't ever want people to feel like they have to pay to go to church. So um, we'll have our normal service the way we always do. It will actually still be a very different thing than, than what goes on over there. So if you want to come to both, great. If you want to come to neither, that's fine. Tune in online, whatever. Um, just wanted to be very clear about all that stuff. So uh, whether you're here with us remotely or in the flesh, welcome. Oh, SundaySoulBrunch.com. And, and uh, welcome. Don't clap for that. Cool. You'll have to bear with me. My allergies are particularly bad today. But we value highly the metaphor of journey. We're different people from different places and backgrounds, representing a multi generational community, and we've traveled different paths. So we agree not to make assumptions about the person across from us, next to us, or in conversation with us. We challenge ourselves to be sensitive, knowing this community includes a diverse group of people, from lifelong followers of Jesus to people who are just now open to the idea that God might exist. We strive to avoid offense, ask good questions, articulate and explain our responses. We don't assume fluency in Bible, spirituality, or church language, because we believe the message of Jesus is not for Christianity, but for humanity. So we do everything in the spirit of love and grace.
Uh, bummer. So um, go ahead and sit a little heavier in your chair. We're going to spend a few moments in silence. And as you take some deep breaths, think about the peace of this beautiful day. Think of that moment when you realized it was a glorious day. The wind was perfect, the sun, the time with your family, the time with your friends, the time with your sense of love, your sense of peace. And as you sit in silence, concentrate. Come back to those feelings of peace. If your mind strays to worry or anger, nudge it back. Bring it back to that feeling. We'll sit in silence for four minutes.
to all that I have yet seen. Mirroring back on me, you'll be still bids me how a scene. Eyes like burning coals, a kind in all the mammoth's way. We're hiding in that mind is an attempt at heaven's gate. All I found in this fallen land leads me to believe that I'm away. All I found in this dragon's den is yours to take. Yours to take. But you can't take it with you when you go. You can't take it with you when you go. Take it with you when you go. Orphan gold, it sings of smoke and fire and death's design. Diamonds, gold, and rings that pale and tire and cease to shine. Uh -oh. I found in this foreign land Leads me to believe that I'm away yeah. uh -oh. I found in this dragon's den is yours to take It's yours to take But you can't take it with you when you go You can't take it with you when you go This white cloth, I see your heart, the green, it leaves you in fits and starts on age and priceless, these things you love no more than vices, more than in you. you can't take it with you when you go. You can't take it with you when you go. Oh, you can't take it with you when you go. You can't take it with you when you go. Uh, I neglected to say this a few minutes ago, but uh, <coughs> Mike, this is Mike Furlong. He uh, he used to be the house band, um, and then that built over the years. There were many iterations of the house band, and uh, a little <coughs> while ago he got married and moved to North Carolina, um, and we obviously still have an amazing house band, but in addition tonight we had the privilege of having Mike with the house band. Uh, he's here on tour as Mike the Prophet, M-I-C, Mike the Prophet. Uh, and we just happened to have him both for Easter and then again for this weekend with Pete here. So have another hand for Mike. <clears throat> that was such a stark cutoff to the end of the clap. Mm -hmm. It was on and then not. Uh, so Dr. Peter... Rollins has a BA in honors in scholastic philosophy, an MA in political theory and social criticism. This is on Wikipedia, by the way. Uh, a PhD in post-structural theory from the Queen's University in Belfast. He has authored six books that he knows of, uh, How Not to Speak of God, The Fidelity of Betrayal, The Orthodox Heretic, and Other Impossible Tales, Insurrection, The Idolatry of God, The Divine Magician. And we heard last night about a potential children's book that he's writing. Um, or maybe nursery rhymes, I don't know, maybe not a children's book. So uh, he has developed experimental, what he calls transformance art congregations, Icon, Icon NYC, 
He's traveled all over the world speaking on subjects of his books and education and passions, and he's a fan of The Walking Dead. Uh, so over the years, he has come into the orbit of, uh, of Collective, and he's come to be a good friend of mine and to be a very supportive figure in the life and direction and future of this congregation. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Rollins, come on down. <laughs> So if you're, uh, if you're here for the first time and you don't know what's going on, Pete has been in for the weekend doing a series of events, and we figured rather than a sermon, uh, I would get to interview him. So um, I'm not actually sure which one of us is on the hot seat. This is a lot of pressure. Um, By the way, you know, whenever people would clap for Stalin, they would clap and clap for like 10 minutes, and then as soon as the first person stopped clapping, everyone would stop. And then often the person who was the first to stop clapping would be taken to the gulags. <laughs> so I was watching who was the first to stop clapping. But you can tell when it cuts off, it's not authentic. Then you're in trouble. Yeah, you're in trouble. Are you on? Is your mic back I on? I don't think I am on. Let's see. Oh, Is it on? Hey, OK, cool. Look at that. It's weird. It's different from up here. You can't tell. The speakers are all going that way. Um, just wanted to make sure you got the gulag joke. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> we got that on film. Good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, one of the questions I've gotten a lot this weekend and then over the years is, uh, well, it's really not even a question. It's sort of exasperation, like Peter Rollins, DeLand. Um, so how, how does Peter Rollins end up to land? Uh, we figured we'd start with, with sort of how this happens. So um, in 2008, I was listening to my iPod. They existed in 2008. They were separate from the phone. Um, so, and I heard this talk from the Mars Hill Bible Church congregation, Rob Bell's church, and Peter Rollins was there um, giving what was called a sermon, but it was really a Peter Rollins' talk. Uh, and I was like, this is crazy. And so I said to my friend Clark, you should hear this. This is amazing. Um, and Clark was on Twitter, and I wasn't. So he followed Pete on Twitter. And it probably was a year and a half later or so, he said, hey, Peter tweeted that he's coming to Orlando and, you know, wondered if there's any place he should talk. I joined Twitter for Peter Rollins. Oh. Um, yeah. And uh, so we got a hold of Pete and we said, hey, we have this little, like, 20-person congregation that meets in a comedy club. Um, you know, why don't you, why don't you come and we can, like, guarantee you a few hundred bucks and then whatever happens at the door. So uh, he showed up and, uh, and there was sort of some funny stories about after the lecture. Best anyway. payment I've ever had, by the way. Yes, right. <laughs> Not to 200 date. bucks, two dates. Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, yep. So, uh, so we hung out late into the night, kind of got to know each other better. And then over the years, we've sort of gone back and forth. Pete invited me up to some events that he did where he was living, and then we would, we would bring him back. Uh, and so the, the relationship has sort of grown and developed from there. Um, anything to add to that love story, that meet cute? It sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So we want to start, and this is something I talked with several people about in, in, uh, in the, the several weeks leading up to this. Um, you know, I'm going to have an opportunity to ask Pete some questions. You know, what do we want to know? And one of the things that, that came back was to sort of humanize you um, in the sense that people get uh, exposed to your work and sort of the thoughts, and they see the videos and that stuff, um, but don't really know maybe like where you came from and, and you know, a bit of that background. So maybe take us from, you know, Peter Rollins, uh, the world is graced with your birth, <laughs> to where you become an evangelist, just in a few minutes. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland. I'm going back there tomorrow for a little festival that I run um, every year where I bring 50 people from all over the world. Uh, to Belfast for four days of drinking, conspiring, and doing music together. So, uh, but that's where I'm from. Um, and what else would you like to know? I don't know. But I'm, uh, so, <laughs> so we'll, we'll do this. That's my biography. It's very right. short. <laughs> from Belfast. Yeah, from that's Belfast. That's what your tombstone will say too. Yeah. Well, from I mean, to be honest, my life was very kind of uneventful. I, the fact that I you know, for example, do philosophy and theology and these things, and I'm a writer and all of that. That's very bizarre. I dropped out of school at 16, no qualifications. Um, I hadn't read a book, had no interest in anything like that. Um, I was just kind of like a complete dropout. And this whole turn towards an interest in matters of faith and in the academic world, in writing, is absolutely weird. Anyone who knew me when I was 16 would never have guessed that I would have done anything 
uh, the so, way but, I do. And when you were 17, you came into contact with some sort of evangelical religious kind of movement? Right? Yeah, And I then did. how did you get, how did, how did that sort of happen? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that's a, it, it, that's a kind of interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but, but I, around that time, um, yeah, I, was, I went to see Gremlins. I think it was Gremlins, the movie that was in the cinema. <laughs> this is giving this away is my age. This is why the interview is important. Yeah, Gremlins. that's right. <laughs> it was the third anniversary of my 40th birthday two days ago. So I am getting older. Um, and yeah, I came out of the cinema with a pile of friends, and there was actually a street evangelism team doing um, uh, dramas um, uh, about of Jesus. There's one called Six by Four, which I could still, if I had four other people, I could do it right now. They, were, they, they did the pagan sandwich where they, you have a, a group doing something at the front, and then they have, a, they have a line of Christians, and then we pagans come in, and then they do a line of Christians at the back. Right, that's a pagan sandwich, because you're sandwiched between two groups of Christians. So whenever the drama finishes, they turn around and grab you. Um, and so uh, they, they had, a, they had a, a rap group called Run to JC, playing, right? <laughs> and I still remember the yes. line. Uh, let's, let, me, let me try and get this. We're run the JC, and we all know that heaven is the place to be. For 2,000 years or more, God's been knocking on your door, waiting to come in to deliver your sin. You know, some of you people think he's no good, and I can't remember the rest, but I was blown away. In fact, one of the people in Run the JC is now a famous musician, but I shouldn't say on the camera who that is, but I can tell you afterwards. Um, <laughs> I, was, uh, I saw all of this, and one of my friends, uh, everybody else kind of went home, but one of my friends got really interested in this. And he, he was profoundly moved by, you know, late conversations. We sat there in the church across the road. And I was there as well, and I participated. But anyway, about a week later, something really crazy happened, which is, but, um, but anyway, I had kind of a type of religious experience, um, just basically on my own. And a religious experience, I think, in its purest form is not an experience of something. It's what transforms your experience of everything. So you don't experience something. It's not like that you experience 10 things in the world, and then suddenly you experience 11 things in the world. But rather, how you experience the 10 things that are already in your world are, is, it, is different. So I had this momentary kind of like, you know, it's kind of like rebirth is, I mean, I like this term. I love conservative terms. And rebirth's an interesting one because you don't experience your birth. Your birth is what opens you up to experience. So, you know, you don't experience your life. Your life is what allows you to experience everything. So to go through a type of birthing is to, go, is to enter into a world of experience. And I, I, this kind of happened. This is by no means limited to, you know, people, uh, Christians or North Americans or whatever. This is a, an experience that has been written about and known about since the dawn of time. But I had this, this event took place. And um, I completely changed my life. And I wanted to try to come to understand it. So I turned to those people who talked about this event in, in their own way, um, who tried to unconceal or reveal what was going on in language. And the church was one of those places. And so I came to the church to try to help to understand and remain faithful to that event. Awesome, perfect. So it's always very hard <laughs> to talk about, by the way, a religious experience. As we see how I'm trying to push language and you know, you're struggling with words like unconceal and reveal an event. Um, we, we could talk all night about that, but It's interesting, can't. I think, as well, the way, that, the way that time and perspective and education change what the event actually was. Like yeah. the thing that you were so sure it was in the moment, you look back five years later and 15 years later, and have radically different ways of understanding what even happened, yeah. at, you know, at the event. Well, it was, and it was funny, but like what happened, we really, I, I came home to my parents, and it was a Sunday afternoon, and I said to my family, mom, dad, they were drinking their gin and tonics, you know, I was like, I'm no longer your son. I'm like, 
what? <laughs> Which is a weird thing to say to your family on a Sunday afternoon. Um, and then I proceeded to get rid of all the stuff that I had in my room, just got rid of it all, started giving it to friends and putting most of it in the dining room, which was more annoying to my parents than, them, than telling them I was no longer their son. That's one thing, but could you get the stuff out of the living room, right? <laughs> um, and, and then I, I was doing a computer studies course and, I, and I, I stopped doing it. And now this was, so what was going on? Like, why did I do this? Um, it, it's very hard for, at the time for me to understand what I did, but in retrospect, what I would say is, that what I was trying to say very badly to my parents, who I deeply love and um, have apologized to subsequently, but they're like, you're 17 years old, like you're supposed to hate your family. Uh, you know, the, the worst thing you can have when you're 17 is nice parents who are really kind and let you do everything. How do you write poetry about that? Like, how, do you, how do you write rock songs about that? Differentiation is important. So um, you know, like, like you're a teenager, you're gonna be an idiot. Uh, but but I, part of it was, was strangely me trying to articulate very, very badly that I'd experienced a type of subtraction that momentarily I felt no longer confined by the ideological system in which I'd grown up, Northern Ireland, Belfast, your family, you know, all of that stuff, which is good sometimes, but your understanding of marriage, relationships, ethics, all the things that you grew up with suddenly fell away. And my terrible way of saying that was I'm no longer part of the family, which was me trying to say, I feel subtracted from the ideological waters I was immersed in. And then whenever I got rid of my stuff. What was I doing? Well, my stuff was just aspirational. It was silly things. It was like poster of a Ferrari Testarossa. I really like Miami Vice, by the way. Hence my invitation. There's I a whole question about it. We'll yeah, okay, we'll that. come back to Miami Vice. Okay, I'm glad to hear it. Um, but, um, you know, I had that on my wall. I had this. Uh, it was more what I valued. And now I just didn't value any of these things. Just didn't, so it, getting rid of my stuff was not some mag magnanimous gesture. It was just like, this stuff means nothing to me. And then when I stopped going to tech, where I was doing this computer studies course, it was like that was the tracks that my life was on, and I suddenly felt utterly free, um, utterly subtracted from the very destiny that I was in, the very fate that I was part of. So the conversion experience at a very fundamental level, nothing was added to my life. Something was radically sub subtracted from it. And so if any of you know my theological work, you'll know that I talk a lot about crucifixion as subtraction. To be crucified was to be subtracted from the political world. You were no longer a citizen. Um, it was to be subtracted from the religious world. You were cursed of God. It was to be subtracted from your culture. You were crucified naked outside the city as, as a nothing, as a nobody with no symbolic value. Before your biological death, you had a symbolic death, as in you had no symbolic value any longer. So strangely, to identify with the cross, in this reading is not to add something to your life, add an identity. You've now got the identity of Christian in, on top of everything else. It's actually to subtract identity. So to identify with Christ is to identify with a subtraction. That's all kind of complicated, but the ultimate idea being that I felt that anything was possible and I had this experience of profound liberation and freedom which I completely wrecked by getting involved in the church. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's another story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, none of us have ever felt that way. <laughs> um, so what, uh, what transferable skills do you think you picked up from being an evangelist that, oh, yeah. that translate to your work now? And, and, and maybe t tell us that by telling us how you then moved from that into sort of uh, began to read, began to you know, pursue academics, philosophy, theology, that kind of stuff. This sort of next phase, how did that happen? Yeah, so I, yeah, I entered a church, gone by a really beautiful community of people. Um, it was, you know, some people have been very damaged by their religious experience, some people have been very healed by it. It's like we're, you imagine two donkeys, it's an old parable, but two donkeys, and one has a, a ton of, of salt on its back, and the other a ton of cotton, and they both go through a lake, and the same lake, but at the end, uh, you know, the, the, the donkey with the cotton, it basically drowns, and the donkey with the salt comes out feeling so much lighter, right? They both enter the same river, they both come out in a different way. 
Uh, and so it's not just different churches produce different, it's the same community can really damage one person and really be healing for another. Um, and it was a very healing and powerful experience, partly because I was totally dumb. I never really read, I never aspired to anything, and suddenly I was hanging around with people who were reading, who were going to a school that you actually were supposed to learn stuff in. I, and I, I, I also learned how to speak in front of people. I learned lots of um, fantastic things. So that community was very important to me. I got fully involved. I threw myself in. I was the idiot. Um, who believed everything that was said. This is something I've talked about in my work, but you know, you go into a community and um, it's like, uh, uh, you know, it's like students who, whenever the teacher says, you've got to read this book, there's, there's a stupid student who actually thinks they're supposed to read the book. Everybody else knows they can just look up Google, right? And, and uh, in church, you know, it's like, you know, you're supposed to go out and, you know, tell people about Jesus or whatever. We all know you're not supposed to, but I was the one who thought you did, right? Um, you know, like I was, I honestly was at a service where, this, this, uh, this GP, a general practitioner, a doctor, gave this talk about healing, you know, miraculous healing. And at the end of it, the person beside me stood up, tripped over and broke their wrist. I'm the naive one. He takes him into the back of this, you know, this church, into this room and just praying for him. He's like in agony and like, oh, it's fine. Don't worry. It'll work. You know, don't have, don't have any doubts. It'll work. Nothing was happening, right? So they eventually got the guy who preached the sermon about miraculous healing. He took one look at the risk and said, get the guy to hospital, right? He's like, <laughs> you're not supposed to actually believe me. <laughs> He's like, you know, you're supposed to pretend you believe it. But if it's your kid who's sick, you call an ambulance, you know? So um, there's a this is what I, we talk about, that there's this kind of like, on the surface level, we affirm certain things, but you know, deep down we know there's a, you know, certain things that we don't believe. Actually, what happens is the true believers, the, one who fully, the ones who fully believe it, are often the ones who get beyond belief. Because basically, if you think of it like this, if you're, a, if you're just going to a church and you're not reading the Bible that much and you're not praying that much, you're not doing the things that they tell you you should be doing, you can think to yourself, if I was doing that, things would be better, right? Now, of course, it's supposed to be better because you went up to the altar call, you did it, but like every product, when it doesn't work, there's supplements, oh, you gotta get the next upgrade, you gotta do this. So in the church, it's, okay, I came to the front, you said everything would be wonderful, it's not, oh, you gotta pray more, you gotta whatever, fast more. But when you do it all, right? You do everything. You want me to read the Bible? Right, I'll do that. You want me to read it backwards? I'll do that. Standing on one foot? I'll do that. Tapping my head and rubbing my stomach? I'll do that. What do you want me to do? I'll do everything. You want me to throw away my record collection? Absolutely, let's bring it on. And then you do it all and you realize, oh, it's just the same. But now you no longer have the illusion. That's why you think, you think oh, right, the leaders, they must, they must be so close to the divine, right? Because they're the leaders, you know? But when you get in there, you think, oh, in that back room, I mean, I know you're all thinking this, in that back room, Ben's having cappuccinos with Christ, right? The angels come down, you know, it's like, so it's the holy of holies. We, you know, you don't know what's going on, but it's incredible. I've been back there. It's like, you know, it's incredible. But no, of course not. It's rubbish. It's just a little office. It's really freezing. Um, uh, and, and when you get into the center and you realize it doesn't hold, sometimes that makes you the most cynical because now you've got a job, you have to keep the whole system running. Or it can lead you to go, maybe faith was never about that in the first place. Maybe it's about something else. And then you can kind of move, move, move into that. And I'd like to talk about that tonight, maybe what, what, that, what that is. So I, so I gave myself fully to this tradition and, um, and eventually that opened up something else. I could actually say something else about that. You, 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 if you pause too long. Like you, you just read the question. I yeah, did. I did. I heard it. I heard it. It's about Miami Vice. No. Um, um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, basically, um, Paul Tillich talks about faith, theologian Paul Tillich. And uh, he defines faith as ultimate concern. So what is faith? Ultimate concern. Which means that, you know, it means what it says. It does what it says on the tin. That you, that you give yourself completely... Um, to something, right? He says that's, that's kind of like the definition of faith. Everyone has faith, that's life. When you give yourself wholly to something, that's an expression of faith. Nothing to do with belief or anything like that. It's a, an act of ultimate concern. But then he says there's two types of faith. Don't think this is good. Faith can be diabolical, absolutely diabolical. Faith is diabolical or idolatrous, he calls it, when you give ultimate concern to something that is not ultimate. So, for example, you give yourself to your nation, 
through, no matter what happens, you'll live and die for your nation. Whatever they do, wherever they bomb, whatever, whatever crimes against humanity, it doesn't matter. Or, or your child, doesn't matter what your child does, you know, it's like your child is perfect. Or in a relationship, they're perfect. But the alternative to for Paul Tillich is not then you give yourself to something abstract. He, he talks about true faith. True faith is when you give yourself absolutely to something finite, but seeing that as encapsulating something that is unconditional, that, is, that, is, that, that cannot be grasped. And to understand this, it, it, it means you can still give yourself to, for example, your nation. You can still be a patriot. There's a, there's a diabolical form of that, and then there's a, a true form of that. The true form is you say, I'm an American, and my country stands for freedom, it stands for democracy, it stands for liberty, and as an American, I commit myself absolutely to those things. And so when my country falls short of those things, as a true patriot, I will stand up and I will challenge it. That's a slightly, it's a very slight difference, but a slight difference to say my country right or wrong, to Yes, I'm utterly committed to my country, but my country embodies values that, that transcend the, the finite. Because you can't really articulate what freedom is. Every time you articulate what freedom is, it's less than freedom. Every time someone says this is what democracy is, it's less than democracy. These are, these are things that are happening in the nation, and that is kind of faith. So what Paul Tillich says is, it's again like a kid. Your little Johnny comes home from school. The teacher phones up. Little Johnny just burnt the, burnt the school down. And you're like, no, that didn't happen. You burnt the school down, you're trying to blame it on little Johnny. Little Johnny's an angel. And if little Johnny burnt the school down, it, the school deserved to be burnt down. Yeah. You go like, let, you know, you have three things about the school. You say he was smoking and the cigarette lit the school. He says, first of all, he says he doesn't smoke. Second of all, he says he put the cigarette out before he went into the school. And thirdly, he said the school was already on fire when he went in, right? You know, so it's not little Johnny's fault. Um, but the, uh, the other thing is where you go, where you love little Johnny so much, and you go, little Johnny, you really let something down, but I believe in you. I believe you can be a better person. Let's work on this. That you absolutely are committed to little Johnny because of the potential of little Johnny, because of, because of what he can be at his best, because of what he can become. So it's absolute commitment, absolute commitment, but it just looks slightly different. And so again, for Tillich, he says, you give yourself absolutely to, say, your church, your denomination, your whatever, you give yourself to that. But what you attach to are those ideals within that. That, that are transcendent, that you never quite grasp. So they are symbols, icons of the invisible. An icon is an object that is visible, you can touch, you know, it's there, but it draws you into what you cannot see. Whereas an idol stops you with what's visible. Idol, just, you can't, you don't move, move beyond. So what I learned in a sense was, was as you go deeper into your tradition, you realize, okay, there's an idolatrous way of me holding my tradition. Um, but the opposite isn't just to, just to let it go. Strangely, an act of faith is where you so love someone or something that you give yourself wholly to it, but to that element of it that is transcendental, that is unconditional. Yeah. So. Well said. This. Uh so this gets actually, I think, part of the, especially the little Johnny piece. Um, my wife actually was wondering how the transition then made. We're sort of past just philosophy and theology now into almost psychology, um, psychoanalysis. And so how did, where in your story did you sort of make that jump from not just uh, the academic side of philosophy and how that pertained to faith and, and theology, but then also to getting into psychoanalysis and maybe how that's impacted your work a little bit? Yeah. I mean, these are all very intimately intertwined, especially in the continental tradition, which is what I'm part of. So it's actually really hard to talk about psychoanalysis and theology and philosophy as, as separate disciplines. Um, they are all in conversation with each other. Uh, they are all kind of borrowing and critiquing and doing interesting things. And actually, for me, if, if you think of uh, Christianity not as a worldview, not as a way of, you know, so that you get those worldview books 
Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, secularism, whatever, and different worldviews and what the different worldviews believe about certain things. If you think, actually, I don't think Christianity is a worldview uh, religion. It's, not, it's, it's something else. If it's, then, in a sense, it doesn't compare and contrast with something like culture or psychoanalysis. It's, it's a you know, ultimate concern. Is not a is not a position. It's not a worldview. It's a way of being in the world. But anyway, so my my interest in psychoanalysis partly grew up because theology in the church is a theory and a technology. It's a theory and a technology. So the theory side of it is there's interesting theories about the world and life and meaning and purpose and I love that stuff. I'm really into it. But it's a technology and the technology is every week we get together and we engage in rituals. And these rituals are designed to somehow help transform us. Um, and that's a, that's a topic that I love to talk about but we don't have time. You're all looking at your watch. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, but 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 the, but it is a technology. I mean, in a world, for example, where everywhere we turn, we are being told we should be whole and complete. Everywhere you turn, you're told if you b purchase the right product, look the right way, go out with the right person, do whatever, you things will work out. That you, so we live under the tyranny of wholeness and happiness, the tyranny of happiness. That's why on Friday nights you feel terrible if you're sitting in because your super ego is saying you should be out having fun, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Look at you, it's boring, right? Which is everywhere we turn, the structures implicitly or explicitly are, are attempting to make us feel anxious and feel depressed by telling us we can do more and be more. So we, you want a place in your life, an oasis in the desert, where you can just be. It's great to live in a place where you can be free to pursue your highest pleasure, but it's also great to have a place where you're freed from the pursuit of your highest pleasure. And they're both important. And so, the technology of Christianity, as I've explored, is entering into a community where you can be, where you can be honest about your anxieties and your darkness and the darkness of your community. You can bring that stuff to the surface. You can work as he healing agents. Right? So there's a technology. Philosophy used to be the same. It was a theory and a technology. Socrates was someone who didn't speak in the universities but spoke on the street. And they, they killed him for it. He was the first martyr of philosophy. And they brought him into court. They said, you're an atheist. You're perverting the minds of the young. You're, you're getting people to question things that shouldn't be questioned. And then after they judged him, they said, you know, before we pronounce punishment, you tell us what you think we should do. And he says, I think you should give me free meals for life and a wage paid for by the state. Right? They didn't agree, so they killed him, right? <laughs> but um, it, was, it was designed not to kind of feed the mind, but a technology of the self to help you become a more beautiful, empathetic, uh, politically engaged individual. And then psychoanalysis, it is another discipline that is a theory and a technology. And the technology of psychoanalysis is similar to, and in fact is very closely related to, what you see in the biblical tradition where um, you, you, you listen to, I mean, yeah, in psychoanalysis, there's this idea, you know, that, you know, our symptoms, which are the little things in your life that, that you know, your outbursts of anger, your bad back, your, your tension, your, your whatever it is, outbursts of crying, whatever these little things are in your life, that they tell you something about something that's not working in your body in your existence, bad relationships, bad jobs, whatever it is, those symptoms that we do. Whenever you cannot speak your unpleasant truth, your unpleasant truth finds way to speak. And you, the, that is called the symptom. And in psychoanalysis, we realize that we try to avoid confronting the brokenness of our lives, the darkness of our lives. We try to avoid it, but it comes out in explosions. It comes out in, in, in violence and aggression and problems, alcoholism, whatever. And you have to listen to those. And if you listen to those, those symptoms become synthoms, Lacan says. Synthom sounds like San Homme in French, which means holy man, which means prophet. Your symptoms become a prophet that call you to a better life. And in theology, what I discover is very, something very, very similar, is that 
And you know that in our society, you know, if we do not look at our darkness, if we do not bring the shadow side to the surface, if we don't look at our dark histories and our dark pasts, they create outbursts of violence in our judicial systems, in our police systems, in our educational systems. And those tell us the truth that there is something broken in our world. And for me, Christianity, um, the prophets have always been the ones, just like the psychoanalyst who, who listen to the symptoms, who speak the unpleasant truths that we don't want to listen to, but those unpleasant truths that will bring healing to our lives and our communities and our cultures. So I, I employ these different disciplines, but they're all intertwined. Perfect. Uh, and and um, part of what I want to do to differentiate this, the we could go a ton deeper in any one of those disciplines and the ways that they sort of swirl together. Um, but that stuff we've sort of been saying all weekend, most of this stuff is free online. Pete's got a Vimeo channel. You can check out a bunch of his work. I encourage you to buy his books. Um, I, I want to sort of turn us a little bit back towards getting to know you. Um, and so I'll, I want to start with a, a parable that, that the group helped to tell last night. Uh, in which Meg Ryan is dressed as a man um, with a <laughs> yeah. with a little mustache, and so if you are on a speed date with this Meg Ryan dressed as a man, tiny mustache, and you have the three minute little clock on the speed date, and Meg asks you, "What do you do for a living?" and then the follow up, "What does that mean?" Um, how do you answer at this point in your life? As little as possible, <laughs> three minutes. As okay. Well, Go. that's it. As little as possible. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I I um. I mean, I've always been really just interested in how to live. What does it mean to live and to be? And that's all I've ever tried to do. And even my writing and stuff like that never started off as, as to be a book. Uh, n n you know, not, none of that when I started Icons Community never started off with an idea that it would, would grow into something. I had a sense that that might happen, but um, it's always been, you know, how to live. Uh, and that's that's what I do, and I'm really lucky that I get to talk to people like you about that. I get to strangely somehow make a living, mostly through the generosity of individuals who've supported that work for me, helped me get on my feet. Um, but like I'd be doing this anyway. Like it's great that you're here, right? Because because. If you're not here, this looks like a mental illness, me talking <laughs> to an empty room, which is what I would be doing, right? But you give it the kind of, you make me look normal, and I really appreciate that. You know, I really value that you would take time out to come here to like solidify, make me not look crazy. But it's kind of like I'd be doing this whether you were here or not, because the question for me is how, 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 how to live. Beautiful. And, um, uh, so, so I want to do sort of a bit of a, a lightning round, kind of getting to know you thing, and then I want to come back to your work and let, let you help us know how to continue to engage with what you've got coming up. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to do? Oh, I couldn't do anything else. I've no, neither the skills nor the, the I'm like work, bring, I'm allergic to work. It brings me out in a sweat. I mean, <laughs> the, it's really weird. The more I just like fitness and stuff like that, I mean, it's weird. It just brings me out, I get sweat, I, it's, it's terrible. So I don't, I don't, I can't imagine I would, could do anything else. Uh, tell us, tell us what is true about you today that would make your eight year old self cry? Oh, my eight-year-old self. I'm t I can't remember anything from when I was before 16. There must be some terrible stuff there. So no, I mean, it's, <laughs> but, so what, my eight-year-old. What's what? What age is an eight-year-old? What height are they? They're eight. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 ah, that's yeah. Okay. That was teed up pretty high. Yeah. What, what age is June? Uh, June is five. Okay, so, so a little bit before. She's going to be five in two months. Oh, that's terrible. F five, and then you notice how you very quickly put ish on it. Just to, like, yeah, she's going to be five in two months. Stop passing numbers, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my age, what, what would make my age yeah, year old? Second so? grade. Second grade. I don't even know what that means. Ireland? No, yeah. it's not. My Primary school. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I don't even know what I wanted to be at that age, so... I kind of don't You're living the dream. Then. I'm living the dream. I do feel like that. I mean, people say, "What would you, you know? What do you want to do when you when, not when you grow up anymore?" <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, you know, what, where do you want to be in ten years? It's really difficult for me to answer that because I, by the way, I have my down times and all of that. But actually, like, I, I I'm kind of doing what I really want to do. Yeah. So that's a gift. I just want a, a golden toilet and a, and maybe in a private jet, and then I and then and then I would be happy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so somebody else asked, asked this, um, or, or asked me to ask it, and I love the wording of it. Uh, what is the best book that you've read that we normals would enjoy? <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Oh. And I'm careful to choose the word enjoy, because not just that we could understand or, or you know, read, because I've tried Caputo. Oh, yeah. yeah. So what's accessible? What's something yeah. that, that you've read that you think would really connect with people? Yeah. I mean, and this is the thing. So I, like, you know, so, you know, it sounds like, a, you know, you read out my degrees, and it sounds like I've, I've done all this reading and all of that, but I have never found that easy. What, what I had to do is I had to kind of switch something in my head that basically said one paragraph of something really deep and good is probably worth a whole book of something that's, not, that's pretty rubbish, right? That actually a lot of books are like snow deserts. Um, I've heard that a snow desert, it, there's snow everywhere, but when you crush the snow together to try to get some water, there's virtually nothing there. So you'll, you will die of thirst, even though you're surrounded by snow. And at some point, I realized that there are a lot of books that are a bit like that. And I thought, okay, what would it be like to read someone like Kierkegaard, for example? You go, this is a nightmare. But then you realize one, one paragraph of this is actually incredible. So there's people I know who are quick readers, but I am a real advocate for slow reading. Like, read slowly. I read very slowly. But you read for one page and you go out for a walk, you have a bath, you think about it. So I actually think, you know, when you say, I think, you know, you can, anyone can read anything, especially with Google now. But, but there's, there's some authors, I think, for example, there's some beautiful authors um, who, who write parables or bring parables together. I, I did a night of parables last night, one called Song of the Bird by Anthony DeMello. It's a stunning book of parables. Um, there are, there's a little book called On Religion by John Caputo that's, that's absolutely stunning. But my big thing is like, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Uh, it's just you have to turn, your, turn the, the frustration into enjoyment. I basically had to say to myself, when I read some book that just seems impossible to understand, instead of getting frustrated, I'm going to enjoy it. That's how I did public speaking. I hated public speaking so much, and it made me anxious and all of that. And then I just clicked and went, actually, it feels quite alive. And I just changed how I felt about the emotions, and that really helped me do it. So yeah, but I could recommend a million books. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Everything on Amazon, right? Every, yeah, pretty much. Just go through Amazon. Yeah, start with the A's. Right. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, this is a question I'm going to steal from uh, from James Lipton, who stole it from Bernard Pivot. Uh, if any of you are familiar with In the Actor Studio, probably not. Pretty deep nerd, but uh, he asks. He always asks at the end of the interviews, "If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates?" Oh wow! If heaven exists, what I. Um I wish I'd known this in advance. I heard the podcast is good. Put me on the spot. I specifically um, didn't let you know this one was coming. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, do people have answers to this? Shockingly, yeah. Wow. Actually, yeah. You would think, you know, but they're they're sort of snow deserts of answers. Ah, uh, yeah, you know? yeah. So I I think that's brought me to silence. Let me go. Keep going. I'll see if I can come back to something okay. profound. So, okay, sounds good. Um, so. This is a, we, we've been talking about this kind of off and on for the last couple days. Um, and how many of you are familiar with, with Pete's recent work, Atheism for Lent? He sort of did an online course over the, over the Lenten season. Cool. All right. So more than a handful of us in here. Um, so I found this quote from uh, Emmanuel Levinas. He says, faith is not a question of the existence or non-existence of God. It is believing that love without reward is valuable. Um, and I'm, I'm fascinated. And I think some of the conversations we had with the group of people that did Atheism for Lent. Um, I'm curious about this expression of faith uh, or a way of life, and you kind of touched on it earlier, um, that, that transcends needing these binaries, needing to have the label of atheist and atheist, or as if those, those actually represent what they claim to represent. So maybe yeah. just share a little bit about that. Yeah, I, you know, the, the, um, the, the relationship between theism and atheism is fascinating and much more nuanced than is presented on the average YouTube debate. Right? Um, you know, for a start, uh, it, or the definitions are more porous than we think. Uh, is anybody a theist? Is anybody an atheist? Uh, you know, like there's parts of the, the biggest preacher who believes everything. There are times when they go, is it just made up? Is it just because I was born in a certain culture at a certain time? Um, those are legitimate questions that haunt people. Um, if you are an atheist and very much embrace that, there might be still a part of you that enjoys 
praying occasionally or enjoys you know, singing, going to a, a church. Um, and it's not about saying, oh, that means I'm a theist or that means I'm an atheist. It's just saying that, that in our bodies, we're, we're more complicated than we think. And one of the problems with belief, and this is, brings me to psychoanalysis and theology, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was very good on this, is that actually what we believe, um, we think that what we believe is what we think and what we think we believe, but actually what we think is often designed to protect us from really encountering what we believe. And so this idea initially sounds a bit weird, but I think we can all understand that. I used an example the other night, but I have a certain view of myself. Someone, oh, I love my parents, I think they're great. And someone asks, well, when was the last time you saw them? And they go, oh, well, you know, six months ago. Oh, well, is that the story you tell yourself? Or an alcoholic who says, I can give up any time I want. Um, is that the story they tell themselves to be able to continue on? We create false narratives. We see this obviously on Facebook all the time where you create this false narrative of yourself. You know, all the books that you like to, you know, people to think that you read, you know, you don't mention Fifty Shades of Grey. You kind of, you know, it's like Proust. Um, you know, you, but we, we create these, and it starts when we're very young, we create uh, these uh, images of ourselves and these notions like, I love animals. When I don't, I eat them. I eat them, and I, and I know there's terrible stuff that happens to those animals. I say I love kids, but I don't really. I buy these shoes. I don't care where they come from, you know? Um, and, and often what we do, even in, in church, if you have a prayer, I pray for, you know, the kids in Somalia. I pray for, you know, what's going on in the Congo. I pray, pray for, you know, what's going on in Iraq. You know, I go like, you know, you know, I, you know what? I don't care about the kids in Somalia. I don't care about what's going on in Iraq. I don't care. The prayer is a wonderful way of making me think that I do. Right? It's a great way of making me feel good about myself, creating a very civilized, very nice way of doing it. A more honest prayer would be, I don't care about what's going on in Iraq. I don't care about what's going on in Somalia. I couldn't find them on a map. You know, if I cared, I would at least know where they were. You know, I don't even I wouldn't know what language they spoke. I don't know anything. Um, and I don't care. And why would you do a prayer like that? Well, you know, if you go to AA, there's, a, there's this thing where the first thing you have to do is actually stop telling a false narrative. So you say, my name's Pete and I'm an alcoholic, right? So you take the false narrative that you tell yourself about yourself. Oh, I could give up any time I want. I'm not really an alcoholic. The false narrative, and you make it fit with the material reality. Because your belief is actually designed to protect you from your belief and the reality of what you think and how you act. And you do that not so that you then go, okay, that's what I am, and walk out. You do that so as you're confronted by yourself, you're shocked by yourself. And then, but in a room of grace where you're completely accepted for who you are. So grace is acceptance and accepting that you're accepted. So you experience this acceptance so that you can change. So the weird thing is, the more you try to change sometimes or try to cover over and say everything's great, the worse it is. This is called compulsive repetition, by the way. You know this new age idea of be here now, be in the moment. The past is past. The future is still to come. The only thing you have is the present. Embrace the present, leave the past behind, forget about the future, right? The problem is, the past is never history. Past is never history. You carry your past with you. And it comes out in your present. That's why sometimes you'll find, why do I keep having the type of relationship problems that I've had in the past in the present? You know, the stage changes. The characters change, but the script stays the same. You're still jealous, or you're still, you're still go out with people who are abusive to you. And it gets even more complicated and weird than this. Not only do you seem to always go out with people who are distant, who dislike you, who, who are nasty to you. If they're not, you don't desire those people. And then what's even more weird is if they're not like that, you seem to do actions that will try to provoke them into being that. That strangely, you, you almost not only happen to repeat your past, you, you force the, the present to fit with like the past, right? This is the personal example of that quote. If you do not know your history, you're condemned to repeat it. 
If you do not know your past, you will, you will be condemned to repeat it. And the weird irony is, like, oh, so forget the past. Forget, don't, I don't want to go into that. Let's just live. Then means you're enslaved by it. But if you bring it to the surface and know your truth, the truth will set you free. You will find freedom from it. You'll find ways to move on, of ways to have new types of relationships. Novelty will enter into your future. The problem for most of us is our future will be just like our past. No novelty or difference will enter into it until we can deal with our past, and then the future is novel, what's called apocalyptic, which means the incoming of what you cannot expect. Apocalyptic new things will happen. Not always good things, but the new can happen. Why was I saying all of that? What was the question? <laughs> I, I do that. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my mind. The question. I it, don't know what the question was. It was about compulsive repetition. What was it? History. What was it about? Come on, help me out. This is I also so keeps you guys awake. What's that? Levinas, oh yeah, uh, yes, it was about Levinas, but I think I moved on. Oh yeah, yeah, that was about Levinas originally, good I point. I thought you had moved on too. But I think I moved on from there, but that's kind of where I started. But, um, oh right, the, the, the uh, atheist, theist sort oh, of deal. There you go, atheist, theist, which is kind of what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I still have no idea why, how I got on a compel, compulsive repetition <laughs> from so atheism. Oh yeah, oh, there's a bit of both of us in us. In us. Yeah. We're talking about that, right? And if we don't make peace with that part of ourselves, da 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 da, and then I got into a completely different subject matter. So we can this, edit all this out. Don't worry. Is this, uh, so what, this is maybe a bit of a reflection on that. No. The uh, you need to finish the thought. Well, yeah. In that, I only got halfway in it. But so it's. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, atheism, atheism. So, I know it's yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> the speed date crashed and burned. Yeah. Oh yeah. But, well, one one other thing I'll say about atheism, you know, this, the, uh, and then we can move on. But it's not only yes, are those parts of ourselves a little bit, but that, and we need to make peace with those parts of ourselves. But that, um, you know, doubt, ambiguity, and complexity, I would argue, are part of faith and the life of faith. Um, it's not, the, the theism, atheism divide is a lot more porous, but also a lot of the atheists who are writing about faith um, are critiquing exactly the same type of God that we want to critique. Uh, you know, Freud, for example, critiques um, the, like a type of religion which, is, uh, which feeds into your obsessions. If you're a child, and most children are obsessive, right? At, you know, there's a certain age when most children are obsessive, which means that they, they don't walk on the cracks, they touch both handles, they, you know, whenever they're going to bed. They have to have stories read to them the same time every night, multiple times. All of these obsessive behaviors, right? And why is that? Because it's, they're tiny, they're fragile, they're in a crazy world, and these obsessive rituals help them feel like they've got some control over a crazy world. Now, why would you ever want to take those things away from a child? At first, if you're a parent, you know, you, you give in to them, you read the, the stories, you, they want their teddy bears all in a row before they go to sleep, you do that. As long as it's cute things, you don't mind doing it. But eventually, for very pragmatic reasons, you have to stop because the world isn't as nice as your parents. You can't phone up your boss and say, listen, I know the CEO's in from South Africa, it's a $3 million deal, but you should have seen how many cracks there were in the pavement. I couldn't get anywhere near work, you know? Or, or you know, I, I, yeah, I couldn't leave the house because there was, I, I cleaned it last night, but I knew I had to clean it again, you know? So obsessive compulsive, you have to begin to look at what lies beneath them. So at a certain point you say to the child, why do you have to have all the toys lined up? And the child says, well, I'm worried the monster's gonna get me. The monster comes when daddy's away. You go like, oh. So then you realize that the child's insecure because the dad works all the time, is like maybe on an oil rig, goes away for weeks at a time. You go, oh, so you're actually, this is an anxiety about your father not being around. And of course, your father can't give up the job necessarily, but you can then talk to the kid about your dad works because your dad loves you. And this is part of how he shows his love to you. you. You work that out and the obsession goes. For Freud, he says so much religion becomes a way of preventing us from looking at the difficult things in life. You know, so it's an obsessive rituals that we do, and it helps us, it helps ease our anxiety, but ultimately doesn't help face the difficult parts of our lives, right? Great, I want to critique that. I don't want a faith that, that shields us because we're not courageous enough to look at the difficulties and complexities of life. That allows us to go, can faith help us more courageously enter into life? The way Paul Tillich talks about the courage to be. 
Uh, but I could do that with all of these. So these, 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 these supposed enemies of the faith turn out to be actually potentially great friends who can help us you know, de de delve so much deeper into what it means to, to embrace faith. Speaking of great friends, tell me just a little bit about Scooby-Doo. Oh, yes, <laughs> Scooby-Doo. Um, I think uh, Ben's mentioning this because I'm writing a book at the moment, and uh, I start off with Scooby-Doo. Um, because Scooby-Doo has three parts. Uh, there is, it's a, it's a horror story at first. You know, this truck, if you have watched it, comes into some sort of like town and things are wrong. There's bats everywhere, it's in a graveyard. It's, it's a horror story, right? And then it becomes a ghost story. There's ghosts, why, why, why is it so horrific? Because there are ghosts. And so they, they chase the ghost, the ghost chase them. And then of course it turns into a detective story. You realize that as they do the detective work, the ghosts, are actually really concrete things that need to be tarried with, some like criminal, right? And then they get rid of the criminal and the town is restored to order. Um, I'm saying that like in Northern Ireland, for example, our countries can be like horror stories, very, very difficult and painful things happening. You know, violence, racism, sexism, sectarianism, xenophobia, right? These can be like a horror story. And we go, why is it a horror story? Well, because there are ghosts. What are ghosts? Ghosts are the presence of an absence. They're the presence of something that's no longer there. We all have ghosts. We're all haunted houses. You know, we are. Ghosts are the people we've loved and lost, and people who've loved us, the people we've, we've hurt. All of these, these ghosts that haunt us, our countries have ghosts as well. The things we've done that we'd rather not look at. You know? We push those ghosts down, right? And those ghosts become poltergeists. They smash things, they break things, they erupt in violence, right? But then we realize if we do detective work, those ghosts, um, they refer to real problems, something concrete, something like some problems that we're not looking at that we need to address. And as we address those things, we can bring light and healing to the situation. So in some respects, we all have to be like Scooby-Doo in my country. The, the police force, for example, were uh, militaristic, and sectarian, um, there was violence on the streets, uh, and and this was, it was a horror story, and it was, there were ghosts, things we weren't looking at, things we weren't looking at, brokenness in our own community, in our own lives, we were putting it onto the other, scapegoating, it's their fault. We didn't look at the things that were going on in the society, we blamed other people, you know, we blamed the immigrants, blame this, blame that, they're the problem. Don't look inside, don't look at the problems in the community. But in the 1990s, when the suffering got so bad, eventually the political parties, the Irish government, the British government, the people of Northern Ireland, we had to begin to do difficult work. Why, because we were good people? No, because things were so bad, they were falling apart, it was destroying everybody. We looked at the ghosts, we realized the ghosts reflected real concrete problems in our society that needed to be addressed. And as we tried to address those things, we, we disbanded the police force, the RUC, and we created a new police force, PSNI. We signed a, a Good Friday Agreement. Every major paramilitary group, um, the two governments, the people of Northern Ireland all agreed to it. We made concrete efforts to make change, and the, the, this, the, the country was transformed. It's not without its difficulties and its pain. We can never get rid of that entirely. But it can be transformed, so Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo. <laughs> um, let's wrap up with this and, and sort of a, a transition into, uh, into one of the sort of formative practices in, in our congregation with the Eucharist. Uh, and you, you touched on this last time, but I think there are a lot of people that maybe didn't make it to the lectures, and we haven't really touched on it yet since you've been here this time. Um, but, but draw some connections between the Christian Eucharist and the magic trick and sort of your reading of it. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll go at it kind of this angle. There's sometimes, you know, you could think of the world as split between those who are whole and those who are broken. Yeah. But it's probably safer to say the world can be split between those who are broken and refuse to admit it, and those who are broken and take that on. And uh, most of what we try to do is we try to run from our fears, our brokenness, our anxiety. We, and we put that 
Um, like we think there's certain objects out there that will make us whole. There's certain something, some what I call a sacred object in the book. This is the divine magician because magicians make objects disappear. And the, the object that I talk about in the book is whatever object that you think will take away your brokenness will, will make everything great. And, and by the way, that's no longer the church. If you want to hear a good sermon about living forever, about escaping your material decaying bodies, about traveling faster than the angels, living in the heavens. You don't go to a Baptist church, you listen to a TED talk, right? You'll be able to download yourself in digital form, you'll be able to you know, enter the internet, you'll be able to kind of eventually, you know, maybe be energy, right? By the way, that might be true. That does nothing. Theology has never been about abolishing death that comes at the end of life. I think theology has always been about the death that in, infests life. Because if I could touch you in the forehead and you could live forever, but I couldn't help you experience the depth and density of your life, I wouldn't be a god, I'd be a devil. You know, Maybe medical profession will one day cash the checks that the theologians wrote in the past, but that's not the end of theology, it's the beginning. Because Christianity has always been about life and life in its fullness. Jesus was not talking to the literal dead. He was talking to the living who experienced a type of living death. Um, so we try to run from this brokenness, we flee from it. But the more we flee from it, the more it destroys us, the more it damages our relationships and our world. And so what's important is we try to come to terms with this brokenness. AA, 12-step programs are an amazing example of this. Because you can basically create communities in two ways. Either we have the answer, everything's great, it's those people out there that are the problem. So we unify over a hatred of them. You know, we scapegoat the other. Or you unify in a community of saying, actually, there's brokenness here, there's darkness here, and we need to make peace with that. The guy who set up Burning Man, uh, supposedly, uh, he went through a terrible divorce. Um, his wife had an affair, and um, he couldn't get over it. Four years, uh, he just couldn't get over her. He was thinking about her every day. His friends listened to this day in and day out, and eventually they brought him to a beach and they killed him. No, <laughs> they killed him because he was whining so much. Right? He just would never stop about this woman. Right? No, now, brought him to the beach. They built an effigy and they burnt the effigy. And that was a way of him symbolizing a loss. And in doing that, he began to be freed from the sting of that loss. And he began to be able to move on with his life. So this became a ritual. Every year, they gathered around this effigy. They burnt it. So they gathered together around the ritualization of a shared loss. And now it's a festival of 80,000 people that build these massive effigies. In many ways, I think we, as people, need to find ways of ritualizing and mourning our losses. If you ever go to a, a, a graveyard, you'll see the words, gone but not forgotten, which means they're gone, but you remember the person, they stay with you. But more often than not, the truth of who we are is forgotten but not gone. We try to forget our suffering, our losses, our pains, and when we try to forget them, they remain within us doing damage. So we find ways of ritualizing those losses, remembering those losses, and in doing that, strangely, what we remember we're freed from that oppressive power and it becomes part of us. Those people become part of us in a healthy way. The Last Supper, the Eucharist, is a type of gathering around a shared loss. It's a ritual in which we gather together in remembrance. Um, and it's not a way that people think about the Eucharist very often, but we gather together, the sharing the loss of God and in the book, The Divine Magician, I say there is a sense of Christianity being about the loss of God. The loss of God is the object that will make you whole and complete, the sacred object that will fix you. God, who's just like a bigger version of a BMW, right? He'll just make everything great. But actually, we lose that. We gather together. We lose that type of God. But then, in that loss, we discover that God is not the name of the sacred object, but God is the name of the experience of the sacredness in all objects. So God is not an object that you love, but God is found in the act of love itself. That as you share that loss together, you find you're in the midst of God. 
That's why Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, to live as though God is not given is to live fully before God and with God. You lose God as some idolatrous object that's going to make everything great. You accept the difficult parts of your life. You bring to the surface those aspects of yourself, and you find you're actually standing in the very heart of God. You're standing in the midst of the divine. And so the Eucharist, you'll notice, has three parts. Just like a magic trick. Clark Orr is a very good magician. You can do, I should get him to do a magic trick. You have an object, it's called a pledge. You've got an object. Then there's the turn, the disappearance of the object. And then there is the prestige, which is the return of the object. But actually, the object that returns is usually not the same one that was lost. If a magician makes a bird reappear, it's not the same bird. That first bird is dead. They broke its neck, stuffed it up the sleeve, and the dove that you see is a second dove. Magicians have a lot of dead birds, OK? <laughs> uh, um, in, you'll notice in, the, in, the, in communion, you have the, the, the pledge. You have the bread and the wine, the sacred, as an object that you can touch. The sacred is an object that you can taste, that you can see, just like every other object in the world. You can taste it, you can touch it, you can see it. And then you have the turn, the disappearance of the bread and the wine in your body. It's gone. Where is it? It's gone. The death of God. And then you're waiting for the prestige. And you're waiting, and you're waiting. And then that weird thing where just basically the church ends, and there's no big fireworks, there's no pyrotechnics, there's not eye of the tiger, there's no big ba -da! It just kind of ends. And you get up, and you go, listen, you want to go for a drink down at Hollows? And you know, I, I know you're having a tough time at the moment. You just broke up with someone. It must be devastating. You just got a new job. Brilliant. But you know, can I help out? You just lost your job. <sighs> you know, you, can, I, can I just help maybe cook some meals? Just whatever it takes. You go down, you have a drink there. You're sitting, you spend the night talking about your life and to talk about stuff. And you realize that is the prestige. That is the return of God. It's God in the midst, among the body of believers. That's where God is there in the act of love itself. In the very moment that you forgot, is the very moment that, that God is there. And that's why church needs to be more like a brewery or an Irish pub, right? Because <laughs> in, a, in a sports bar, you've got alcohol, it helps you forget. You've got loud music that helps you not think about your troubles. You've got uh, everything around you to help you forget about your brokenness. And when you leave, it comes back, so you have to go and get drunk again and again and again. An Irish pub, it's got all the same aspects, but the drink is not there to get you drunk and get you to forget. You have a drink and you talk about your week and what's going on. The music isn't there to get you to forget. It's some really sad Irish guy talking about how his beloved died of scurvy and he'll never love again, right? <laughs> but that, that helps you connect with your mourning and your losses. So it ritualizes those losses so that you begin to find healing. The church can be like a crack house or a sports bar. You get drunk on it, it helps you forget about your darkness for a while, but then it comes back and you become addicted to church. It means you have to go to church every week. There are people who go to church every week. Honestly, I've seen them. It's terrible. Like, why would, <laughs> why would you ever do that? It's crazy. But, you know, church becomes an addiction. Or church can be like an Irish pub. It can be a place where we come and we ritualize through the, the parables, the preaching, the prayers, and the music, ways of of bringing that stuff up. We lose something. We lose the God who is this object that, oh, makes everything great, you know, the obsessive that thing. But then we gain something infinitely more wonderful. God in the midst, in the midst of life, helping us be loving and caring with one another, bringing heal healing to our existence. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, cheers. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> we'll get another one. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I need to add much to that uh, other than to say we're going to gather again around uh, these same symbols, the symbols of these sacred objects that continue to need to be broken and poured out so that we can find the life that is infinitely better than the promises that they cannot keep.
We wanted to be trusty and true, but feathers fell from our wings. We wanted to be. Worthy of you, but whether you leaned on our dreams, and we can't take back what is done, what is past. So, fellas, lean down. Your fears, and we can't take back what is done, what is past. So let us start from Lusty or loon, nor tethered to prudish strings. We never wanted to be jealously tuned, nor withered to ugly things. And we can't take back what is done, what is past. So, fellas, lay down your spears. And we can't take back what is done, what is past. So let us start from If all that you are 
is nine. All you desire, then come. Thank you all for coming. Thanks again to Mike the Prophet and the house band and Pete Rollins. Another hand for Pete Rollins. Uh, supply and demand is in his favor tonight. I think he's almost sold out of books over the course of the weekend, so I think he's got about five left. So if you're interested, uh, head over there. You can grab a book. Uh, if you are our guest, thanks for being here with us. If you'd like to get a little bit know, know a little bit more about Collective, we'll be hanging out over at uh, the bar. If you want to sign up for the weekly email or contribute financially to Collective, you can do that at the support and connect table. We had a generous benefactor offer to buy beers for everybody. So the rest of the beer has been purchased. If you'd like one, you're welcome to grab one. Uh, uh, so amazing, thanks for that. Um, we appreciate everybody being here for, uh, for Pete coming for the weekend. Grace and peace. <laughs>